Welcome to The Free Will Show, a podcast that provides a beginner-friendly introduction to free will while also exploring cutting-edge developments on the topic. I'm Taylor Sear. And I'm Matt Flummer. In the previous episode, we discussed classical compatibilism. In this episode, we'll talk about a view that has come to be known as dispositional compatibilism, which is a new development of the classical compatibilist position. Our guest in this episode is Kadri Vivalin. And as always, if you have any questions that you'd like us to answer in our Q&A episode at the end of the season, feel free to get in touch with us at thefreewillshow.com or via social media at The Free Will Show. I'm happy to introduce Kadri Vivalin, who's professor of philosophy at the University of Southern California. She's written many influential papers on topics in metaphysics, including several on the metaphysics of free will, as well as a book called Causes, Laws, and Free Will, Why Determinism Doesn't Matter, which was published in 2013 by Oxford University Press. Kadri also has a chapter in the Rutledge Companion to Free Will uh, that gives a very accessible presentation of her view, um, which we're calling the episode uh, Dispositional Compatibilism, uh, which I'm sure we'll refer to later on in the episode. So welcome to the show, Kadri. Uh, could you start by telling us and our audience a bit about yourself, your work, and how you came to be interested in working on free will? Uh, yes. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm a philosopher at USC. I've got interests in three main overlapping areas, free will and determinism, ability and possibility, and causation and counterfactuals. Uh, I've written a book on free will. We could talk about that more later, but I might be best known in philosophical circles for my work on time travel. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, time travel presents a really interesting problem for freedom of action, which isn't the same as free will. Uh, we could lose a lot of freedom of action by being locked up, say, or bound and gagged, but we don't necessarily lose any free will. Time travel seems to threaten free freedom of action because of the problem known usually as the grandfather problem. Mm -hmm. uh, but you can put it more vividly in terms of your mother or even your own baby self. It's really easy to kill a baby. Philosophers <laughs> like these bloodthirsty <laughs> examples, right? Yeah. So if, if time travel were possible, then it seems you could travel back in time and kill your own mom or your baby self. After all, uh, you would have what we would ordinarily call the ability and the mm -hmm. opportunity. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, it seems you can't do it. If you killed your mom when she was just a baby, you would never be, have been bored, and then you couldn't have traveled back to try and kill that baby. This is really interesting because it looks like an a priori argument against something that seems logically possible, uh, and which is actually being taken seriously by some physicists. But here, philosophers sort of beat the physicist to the punch. <laughs> A very well-known philosopher, David Lewis, wrote many, many years ago, 1976, an article in which he very persuasively uh, responded to this objection, and he actually convinced most philosophers. Though, mind you, I think most of these philosophers are compatibilists. Um, so in a nutshell, he argued that time travel is confusing because we know so much about the past. So we tend to turn fatalists. We tend to think mm -hmm. that you can't change the past. It's already happened. <laughs> but if we keep clear about the distinction between what somebody does or what they will do and what they must do, I mean, for instance, tomorrow morning, I'll have two cups of coffee when I first wake up. I always do. But it doesn't follow that I couldn't have tea or orange juice. Instead, I just won't. So similarly, Lewis argued that time travel po puts no restrictions on our freedom. A time traveler can do anything that anyone else can do. So if you went back in time, you could kill your own mom or your baby self. You just won't do it you'll slip on a banana peel at the last minute or something. <laughs> uh, and while I agree with a lot of what Lewis says, he's a brilliant philosopher, uh, this argument began to really bug me, and I eventually <laughs> figured out why. So I wrote a paper uh, arguing 
that despite appearances, the time traveler really can't kill their mother or baby self. And this has something to do with counterfactuals and the laws. Uh, basically, uh, our laws don't allow resurrection from the dead. <laughs> so if you killed your mother or your baby self, the only way in which you could do the thing would be to be resurrected from the dead, and that's impossible given the laws. So while I've noted free will circles for arguing that free will is, despite appearance, is compatible with determinism, I've noted time travel circles for arguing, many think perversely, that <laughs> time travel is incompatible with certain kinds of freedom of action. Yeah. Uh, I just told you more than you needed to know, but I think... <laughs> oh, yeah, that was great. <laughs> I, I think I actually learned a lot about free will and determinism by thinking hard about this problem of unfreedom. So... Mm -hmm. um, I think now would be a good time. So you mentioned the difference between freedom of action and free will. So why don't you give us like a gloss on what you take free will to be? Ah, uh, okay. I don't, I'm going to actually give you a very simple answer. Uh, this is not my view. This is what people think free will is. And I know this because I have taught a course, a uh, freshman course called Free Will and Determinism, which we actually talk about free will and determinism for an entire semester. <laughs> and on the first day of class, I give the students a free will quiz before I've ever said a single word about free will, so they haven't been brainwashed. And I ask them, do you have free will? And almost everybody, except a few uh, seniors or juniors, say, yes, of course. And then I ask, when did you begin to have free will? Do you have it all the time or some of the time? And they give wildly different answers, <laughs> ranging from I've had it since I was born to when I started to walk, talk, argue with my parents when I came to college. <laughs> but <laughs> there's also a pattern in the replies, and it turns out that what people think free will is, is simply having, making and having choices. Mm -hmm. And the disagreement, I think, is about what's required to make and have a choice. Quite a few students will fill it in with something like when I'm making choices by thinking for myself. And of course, the big question is, what is it to think for yourself? One student offered, uh, it's the ability to ask questions, which I thought was a nice way of putting it. But that's what I think free will is. I think that's what most people think free will is, though I think some philosophers think free will is something more complicated and difficult. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Why do you think free will is important? Uh, why is free will important? Uh, I'm not sure that it is important. Um, <laughs> right? Are, you, are we more important because we have free will? Uh, would we be missing something important if we didn't have it? I do think that free will matters to most of us, not all of us. And it matters for pretty obvious reasons. Uh, without free will, without having choices about our lives, we wouldn't have any control over our lives. It would never be up to us what we do. Uh, we wouldn't be morally responsible, right? Because it's not fair to blame us uh, for something that we have no choice about. But also, I think free will makes life more interesting than it would be without it. To have free will is to have abilities and possibilities, including abilities you never exercise and possibilities you don't take advantage of. And that's just interesting, or so I think. Mm -hmm. So is it thinking about uh, our lives being interesting or moral responsibility or something else that um, helped, you know, in your coming to be interested in working on free will? Uh, actually, I came to be interested in free will before I had done any serious philosophy. I was a philosophy dropout. I took one <laughs> course in my first year at university, decided it wasn't for me, switched to theater and then English. But I did a second undergraduate degree at Oxford in law. 
And one of my favorite classes was a criminology class mm -hmm. where we read, among other things, articles by criminologists arguing that crime is a disease. Then one day, the class took a field trip to a prison. It was an Oxford prison. So the prisoners were probably used to being visited by students. At any rate, they were very articulate. And they all said the same thing, that they had committed their crimes of their own free will and that they were morally and criminally responsible. So my initial interest in free will came from trying to reconcile the arguments of the criminologists with the arguments of the prisoners. Hmm. The criminologists had pointed to the causes of crime. The prisoners were claiming that they were causes. Who was right or hmm. could both be right? So that's really the philosophical problem of free will and determinism, which I had mm -hmm. stumbled on in a real life context outside of philosophy class. That's very yeah, fascinating. That's interesting. Yeah. yeah. Well, we're calling this episode, uh, as I mentioned when I introduced you, uh, dispositional compatibilism. And your view is that uh, free will and abilities are similar to dispositions. So maybe before we get into the compatibilism part, uh, would you mind explaining what dispositions are? Uh, yes. Um, but first, if I might say why free will is so clearly threatened by determinism. You probably got oh, over sure. this before in earlier episodes, mm -hmm. but I think it's philosophically interesting that on the one hand, it seems obvious to everyone that we have free will. Maybe not obvious to philosophers, right? But to ordinary people, my students, yeah, you make choices. You make choices. And if you make a choice, you have a choice. And to have a choice is to be able to do more than one thing. So on the one hand, it seems as obvious as the fact that there are tables and chairs and that we continue to exist through time, all these things, that we have free will. But then, on the other hand, as soon as we learn what determinism is, it seems impossible that we have free will, right? <laughs> because if determinism is true, then there are facts about the past, say facts about how things were on the day of your birth, which together with the laws are such that it's in principle possible to deduce what you will do right now or tomorrow. And that makes it seem impossible that we do anything other than what we do. So if we try to put this together with our experience of making choices, it seems that, well, maybe we still go through a process that we call making a choice there is something illusory about the process because you don't have a choice. You think you're choosing among real options, but really there aren't any. So what you choose and do is the only thing you can do, which is bizarre, right? Because mm -hmm. it doesn't mm -hmm. seem that way. So mm -hmm. dispositions, uh, so not talking about free will at all. Uh, dispositions are everywhere. Dispositions are causal properties of things and objects. We causally interact with objects, uh, and we actually learn about our own abilities. We learn what we're able to do and not do by uh, doing experiments with objects. Um, babies learn about things by, say, throwing them. They learn that a rubber ball can bounce. It's bounceable. That's a disposition, a book is not, a piece of elastic, a rubber band is elastic, uh, it can be stretched, uh, plasticine is malleable, it can be sh made into different shapes. Um, a glass is fragile and a rock can break a window. Okay, so here are some features of dispositions. There are real properties of things. Take fragility. Uh, we know that crystal glasses are fragile. If you're moving, you pack them carefully so they won't break. The glass is fragile even during the times that it's not breaking. A glass might be fragile even if it never breaks. Um, 
And yet to say that something as a disposition, to say that it's fragile or malleable or elastic or something that can break windows is to say that it can do certain kinds of things in certain conditions. Uh, finally, dispositions are clearly compatible with determinism. Nobody thinks that because determinism is true, there aren't fragile objects. Or to, you, to give an example of a different kind of disposition, that rocks are not disposed to break windows uh, when they're thrown at windows. Mm -hmm. Now, none of this seems to have much to do with free will, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so now that we've gotten dispositions in general, uh, what do these dispositions have to, to do with free will? What does it mean to be a dispositional compatibilist? Uh, well, I'm a dispositional compatibilist not because I think that what we mean by words like I have free will or I have the ability to make choices have the same meaning as dispositions. Uh, when we use the word disposition and when we look at some of the examples I gave of dispositions, we think that's the opposite of free will because dispositions seem to be passive. A fragile thing is a thing that can be broken. It suffers a change that's caused by something external to it. But dispositions in the broader metaphysical sense are just causal powers, powers to cause or be caused. So a different kind of disposition, one which seems more active, is the power of a rock to break windows. Of course, a rock won't break windows by itself. It has to be thrown by a person. But the rock has a real power to do things uh, that, for instance, a paper airplane does not. Uh, we have free will, I think, by having abilities. In fact, in my view, to have free will is to have a bundle of different abilities. And I think much of the disagreement about free will, not just the philosophical disagreement, but the uncertainty about, you know, the disagreement and confusion among my students about whether we have free will when we're born or when we start to walk or talk or whatever, uh, has to do with uncertainty about what bundle of abilities we need to have free will. Earlier, I said there's a difference between free will and freedom of action. But when we think of ourselves as having free will, we actually think of ourselves as having both, right? We think we're able to make choices, and choosing is something that happens inside our heads right? We might be able to choose even if we can't act on our choice. But we also think that we often typically have the power to act on our choices. So to give a simple example, right now, I think I'm free to uh, leave this conversation and take a walk. I'm not going to do that, right? I'm <laughs> going to keep on talking to you. But uh, I'm able to do that. Uh, what makes it true that I'm able well, I have some pretty simple abilities I've had since I was about one or two years old. I'm able to walk. I'm able to move my limbs. Um, I'm able to leave the house. The door isn't locked. Uh, there is nobody outside trying to keep me from leaving the house. Uh, but more importantly, and to the point with free will, I'm able to uh, decide, choose, form the intention to do these things. Um, I'm able to reflect on reasons for leaving the house, ending this conversation and taking the walk, or to continue talking with you guys. Uh, on my view, this bundle of abilities is a bundle of dispositions. Uh, dispositions, remember, are causal powers that an object has in virtue of certain intrinsic properties. Uh, the, the structure, the crystal structure of a glass is what makes it fragile. Uh, and, there, and in virtue of having these properties, the object has the power or ability to respond in certain ways to certain stimuli. 
I think that the abilities that give us free will have a similar causal structure. So again, for instance, uh, one part of my ability to leave now and take a walk is that if I decided or tried to do that, I would. I have what it takes. My legs aren't broken. Mm -hmm. Another part of it is that I have the ability to form the intention in response to the stimuli of my having a thought uh, that I don't actually have. You know, say I suddenly got fed up with this conversation and decided it's time <laughs> to get some fresh air, then I might do so, but I won't. <laughs> Not to worry. <laughs> so that's the basic idea. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, in the, the first episode of uh, this season, we talked with uh, Chris Franklin, who defended a version of event causal libertarianism. And one of the things that came up in talking about why he's an incompatibilist was that while he thinks that abilities and the ability to do otherwise, um, in a certain sense, that's all compatible with determinism, he thinks there's this further thing, what he calls it opportunity. Um, some people use different terms for it, but he thinks there's something missing in a deterministic world. You might have a disposition or a bundle of abilities that make it seem like you're really able to do otherwise in one sense, but you, he thinks you're, you lack the opportunity to exercise uh, your abilities in more than one way, more than the actual way that you manifest your abilities. So I wondered if you had any thoughts about that. Uh, yes, thanks. That's a good question. Uh, the, the free will problem is a hard one because uh, questions about ability and opportunity are difficult. Uh, I spoke of abilities, and on one way of thinking of abilities, they are just intrinsic properties. I have mm -hmm. the ability to walk because I learned how. I've got the skill or competence because my legs aren't broken. I mean, those two things have to be true. I don't forget how to walk when I break my legs, but I'm not able to walk. Uh, on the other hand, in order to actually uh, be able, in the fullest sense, uh, a sense that at one time was called the all-in CAD, uh, to be able to walk is for there to be no impediment to my walking, for me to, ha as it were, have the opportunity to take a walk. I wouldn't have the opportunity to take a walk if the doors were locked and there were a lot of uh, bullies standing by intent on keeping me from leaving the house. So, yes, when we talk about what we're able to do, we actually can mean two different things. We might mean that we have what I call the narrow ability, uh, which is a disposition. To have a narrow ability to walk is to have intrinsically what it takes to walk. Mm -hmm. But to be able in the fullest sense to walk is also to have the opportunity. That's a very rough word, mm -hmm. but I give an account of that. I give an account of opportunities uh, in terms of external or extrinsic features of the environment. So I might have the ability to do something without the opportunity. If there's somebody standing by ready to stop me, if I'm bound and gagged or otherwise physically prevented from doing such a thing. I think uh, Chris Franklin thinks that if there are causes of um, my deciding to do what I do, deterministic causes, then I don't have the opportunity to do that thing. But this is certainly not the way we ordinarily use the word opportunity. Hmm. Interesting. And other incompatibilists, Peter Van and Wagen, for one, uh, deny that this is how determinism would deprive us of free will. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think the uh, more traditional idea is that to have free will, we have some sort of agent causal power, right? Mm -hmm. The idea is that we have a power to cause that's different from the way that rocks break windows. But nobody's actually been able to explain what this power amounts to. <laughs> <laughs> well, before we turn to some objections to dispositional compatibilism, could you say a little bit more about what's uh, unique about this approach to free will and how it's different from other positions in the free will determinism debate? Uh, yes, but again, um, 
I don't like the term dispositional compatibilism. I think every compatibilist should be a dispositional compatibilist. Yeah. Uh, it's just uh, a way of saying that we are parts, we are physical beings. Uh, we do things by using our brains, which are physical things. Uh, and if we want to make sense of our common sense views about how we are agents and have free will, we have to give an account that doesn't deny the facts as we know them about causation and about determinism, which we have pretty good reason to believe is you know, either true or close enough to being true. So I think every compatibilist should agree with me. I think that many compatibilists are not so sure anymore whether they have a right to be compatibilists. Uh, so they focus on moral responsibility rather than on free will and try to give arguments that even if we don't have what I call free will and what I think most people call free will, we might be responsible. Mm -hmm. uh, you asked about dispositional compatibilism. I'm not a compatibilist because I'm a dispositional compatibilist. I'm a compatibilist because I think that the arguments for incompatibilism uh, fail. They mm -hmm. only, they're intuitively persuasive, but that's only because we're not used to thinking in terms of determinism. And we get alarmed when we have to think of ourselves as being part of this bigger universe with causes that stretch back in time. Hmm. So what's unique? I guess um, I often feel that my best friends, even though they say I'm wrong, are incompatibilists. I understand. <laughs> I understand what incompatibilists are saying. Uh, as Peter Van Inwagen said in a paper once, uh, uh, incompatibilists and compatibilists mean the same thing by words like, uh, well, he thinks free will doesn't mean much. I, I disagree with that. Hmm. But he says that uh, they mean the same thing by words like ability and able to do otherwise. Uh, um, they mean what ordinary people mean. And I agree with that. Uh, and he says one of us is right about whether determinism means we're never able to do otherwise. And one of us, he was referring to David Lewis, <laughs> is wrong. Uh, but neither of us is making a foolish mistake. So that's my view. I think it's a very complicated question, and I don't think that Chris Franklin or... Uh, Peter Van den Wagen or John Fisher, for that matter, is making a foolish mistake, but I think they're wrong to think that determinism would mean that we don't have this very ordinary kind of uh, free will that we think we have when we make choices. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, let's move on to some objections. Um, in the Routledge Handbook, there's a, a few objections to your view. Oh, I'm just going to give a quote here. Um, having free will cannot be a matter of having any disposition or dispositions. Even if there is a sense in which the lump of sugar is able to, to dissolve, it is not up to the sugar whether it dissolves. And you've already mentioned that the, the sugars being able to dissolve is a passive mm -hmm. disposition, but there's like active dispositions too that you mentioned like a rock breaking a window. So it doesn't seem like it's up to the rock either, whether it breaks the window. So how would you respond to this objection? That's quite right. Uh, yes, the, uh, it's not up to the rock. It's not up to the lump of sugar. But it's not up to the rock or the lump of sugar because neither the lump of sugar nor the rock has a mind. And having a mind is a necessary condition of free will because in order to have free will, you must first do things with your mind, like deliberate, think, and make choices. And rocks and lumps of sugar don't do that. All right. Yeah. So the next objection, <laughs> we're going to refer to something a little more complicated that does arguably have a mind. Um, here's another quotation. A dog has a mind and has dispositions, not only to behave in various ways, but also to make certain kinds of choices. But a dog does not have free will. Yes. So I used to always think that, and I think probably on balance, I still think that maybe it's because I have two dogs who are just not very bright. Some dogs are. <laughs> Mine are not. They're, they're wonderful creatures, but I, I'm sort of skeptical about whether um, 
they have free will, though they do make some very rudimentary choices, and they're pretty good at manipulating me. Uh, <laughs> but uh, one of the somewhat surprising to me answers that I got from my students in the free will quiz was the answer, actually answered to two questions. One question was, do non-human creatures, i.e. dogs or cats, uh, have free will. And the other one was, could any form of AI, not now, but perhaps in the future, have free will? And a large number, maybe as much as a half of the class answered yes to the question about cats and dogs. And about an equally large number, actually maybe two thirds, answered no to the question about AI where I would have answered the opposite. Now, that's changed a little bit. I think I've been teaching this class for 10, 20 years. I think people are now more willing to grant that future AI might indeed have free will. Uh, about babies, uh, cats and dogs, they're still divided. Mm -hmm. So I actually think it's a virtue of my view that it's not clear. Because after all, if we deny free will to cats and dogs, we must deny it to babies. Mm -hmm. And again, common sense is conflicted on this choice. Babies make very simple choices. We don't think they make, most of us don't think they make the sorts of choices that uh, human being, adult human beings, the kind who are, have the sort of free will that gives us, some would say, moral responsibility. So I think it's a virtue of my view that it can explain this hesitation or disagreement. Because in my view, we have free will by having a bundle of abilities. And we gain certain abilities, the abilities we exercise by moving our bodies, the baby crawling around, exploring the world. Uh, we gain those abilities before we gain the kind of mental abilities that uh, we have in having what we might call full-blown free will, the kind that most philosophers who are compatibilists are interested in investigating. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that was great. Yeah, that's great. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask about the third objection that you consider in your chapter in the Rutledge Handbooks, but it takes a little bit of setup, I suppose. Um, you say there that uh, you think of the view we're calling dispositional compatibilism as a sort of newer version of an older view, which we talked about in the last episode uh, called classical compatibilism, uh, according to which the, the right analysis of ability, um, specifically a conditional analysis, um, according to that, the, the ability to do otherwise, and so free will is compatible with determinism. Um, there's this kind of thought experiment, this case that's widely regarded as a counterexample to the conditional analysis. Um, and here's the version that you give in, in your chapter. Uh, Clea is an excellent cyclist, uh, but she had a bad accident and now has a pathological fear of bike riding. So she's not able to try to ride her bike. Um, but since she's in perfect phys physical condition and um, she would succeed in riding if she tried, it seems like she's unable to ride. Um, and yet, according to the conditional analysis, since it's true that if she were to try to ride or if she decided to ride the bike, um, she would, it seems like According to that view, she does have the ability to ride her bike, even though intuitively she lacks that ability. So do you think that um, cases of this type raise any problems for dispositional compatibilism? Okay, I'm going to actually switch to a different case. I think that I replied in that article that you're citing and in my book at great length mm -hmm. to cases of that sort. And I think they are very complicated. Uh, and we can give different answers in different kinds of cases. For instance, uh, someone might be such that she has such a phobia about bike riding that she just uh, uh, can't get on the bike at all. But if somehow, um, and, but if we somehow tricked her into getting on, on the bike, she would still fail to ride it because she would immediately panic. And in that case, the case wouldn't be a counter example. But mm -hmm. there's a simpler case uh, that really is a clear knockdown counter example to the simple conditional analysis. And it's just imagine somebody who is unconscious. Uh, most dramatic example is they're in a coma, but they might also be under general anesthesia for surgery or even sound asleep. Uh, it 
would be true of that person that if they tried to ride a bike or walk or go to the kitchen for a cup of coffee, they would. Because if they tried, they would have to be conscious. And if they were conscious, they would be able to do the thing. But it also seems clear that they're not able to do those things because they're unconscious, right? (laughs) Mm -hmm. Uh, But here, dispositional compatibilism can give the right answer, uh, which is this. Uh, Why is it that we know that the person in a coma or under general anesthesia can't get up and get themselves a cup of coffee? Uh, We know this because for much the same reason that we know that fragile glasses can break and, or, sorry, could break easily, and a different kind of object, say a book or a wooden block, uh, can't break easily. Uh, the book doesn't have the right kind of intrinsic properties that would make it fragile. The person in a coma or under general anesthesia doesn't have the right kind of intrinsic properties that are required for intentional action. To do things intentionally, you have to be conscious, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, you can sleepwalk, but we wouldn't count that, right? We're talking about the kinds of things you can do by forming conscious intentions. And the person who is uh, either comatose under general anesthesia or just asleep, no longer has what it takes to perform intentional actions. And you're sounding a little puzzled, and I did not give this reply. I actually, in my book, in my book I buffed it because I forgot about this case, which is a different kind of case uh-huh. than those other cases of so-called volitional inabilities, because those cases are all much more complicated, because there's a question of whether the person is able to try. Right. And even if they're not able to try, they might be able to succeed, given that they try. Mm-hmm. But maybe maybe this will help. Uh Performing intentional actions, uh, which is what we're talking about here, is really a bundle of two different abilities. One is the ability to succeed in doing what you try to do. Where I, by trying, I'm thinking of uh, the you know when you intend to do something, you might intend to do something without ever trying to do it. You have weakness of will, but to try to do it is to at least begin to carry out the intention. Mm -hmm. So there's that ability, an ability that, for instance, uh, you have with respect to some things and not others. I don't know how to play the piano, so I don't have the ability to succeed in playing it if I try. So that's one ability. Uh, Another ability, though, and which is necessary for someone to have the ability to act intentionally, is the ability to form or acquire the intentions in the first place. And that ability requires a state of normal consciousness. Mm -hmm. That was great. Thanks so much for joining us, uh, Kadri. Where can uh, listeners go to follow your work? Uh, Well, there's my book. Uh, I'm working on another book, but it is not available yet. (laughs) And it's actually (laughs) on causation and counterfactuals and time, not free will. I do have, um, as I said, my favorite articles are about time travel. And I do have a recent article uh, published this year in the Modest called Killing Time Again, which I <laughs> explain again why the time traveler freedom is restricted in certain ways, uh, uh, but not in others. So mm-hmm. in this article, I explain both how the time traveler remains free to do many things uh, and why we shouldn't be surprised uh, why there are certain kinds of constraints and freedom. Uh, I also have a, a website, a sort of philosophy blog, in which I don't put things often enough, but uh, readers can find that by looking at, uh, I think it's just my last name, the villain.com. Great. Right. Yeah, we can include a link to that in our show notes so people can mm-hmm. go check that out. Okay. Yeah. Thanks again for, for being here with us. This was great. In our next episode, we'll be discussing semi compatibilist views about free will. And our guest will be Michael McKenna, professor of philosophy at the University of Arizona. Mm